Uh, hello everybody, my name is Susie Phillips, I'm a subject librarian at Monash University and I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar in the first Cabal Research and Information Group Forum series of 2021. Uh, SOF, Selling Open Scholarship, Innovations in Librarians Advocating for Open Scholarship. On behalf of Cabal and the CRID community, Committee, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia and New Zealand where we live, learn and work. We acknowledge and celebrate the inherent strength of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples and communities and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to welcome and extend my respects to the First Nations people attending today. Please use the hashtag, uh, hash SOS, when commenting on social media during or after the webinar. And if you have any technical questions during the presentation, please type your question into chat and the Cabal team will assist you. So today's two presenters are Lucy Montgomery, Professor of Knowledge Innovation at Curtin University, where she's also co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, and Martin Borchert, University Librarian at University of New South Wales. Lucy and Martin will speak today about how visualization can help support open scholarship, how university libraries can assist in leading the transition to open access, open science, open scholarship, and much more. If you have any questions for the speakers throughout the session, please ask them through the Slido link, which we've added to the chat and the slides. Um, or alternatively, you can go to slido.com or the Slido app and use the event code hash, hash um, 98058. The event will conclude with a Q&A with the speakers facilitated by Michelle Math uh, Matheson from RMIT. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Professor Lucy Montgomery. Thank you, Lucy. So thanks very much, Susanna. Um, I'm just going to hopefully share my screen. Okay, so I'm hoping that that's working. Okay. Um, <laughs> so also want to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that Curtin University sits on. Um, and those are the Noongar Wadjuk people uh, who are the traditional owners of the Swan River Plains in the southwest of Western Australia, which is where the greater metropolitan area of Perth now sits. Um, that land includes Curtin University, where I'm joining this meeting from. And I also want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be joining this session today. Um, so I was genuinely pleased to be invited to take part in this forum because the theme selling open scholarship uh, is one that's really close to my heart. Um, and it's something that's at the core of the work that my research team at Curtin is doing as a group that's committed to producing robust, transparent and trustworthy critical data and analysis about open access and open scholarship. And also because we're unashamedly advocates for open scholarship. So our project is very much focused on how we can use data to support a transition towards open knowledge and more open universities. Sorry, just see what's going on here. Um, so the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative started in 2018 as a stra major strategic research investment by the DBC for research at Curtin University. Uh, and the project's a bit unusual in that it's housed in the humanities faculty at Curtin. And it's a collaboration between the Centre for Culture and Technology and the Curtin Institute for Computation. 
So that means that we really are an interdisciplinary team um, and we're able to combine really serious data science with critical humanities perspectives. So in addition to a team of data scientists, we're lucky enough to have uh, researchers with deep experience in statistical analysis. We've got uh, team members who are doing critical research on diversity, Indigenous education, and the role that libraries play in opening knowledge and engaging communities. And we're also working on the particular challenges associated with how scholarly books and non-traditional research outputs are made visible in big data landscapes. So the byline that we often use to summarise our mission is that we're seeking to evaluate open knowledge performance, analyse diversity of gender, race and nationality, identify independent metrics of what universities do for communities and ignite new new conversations about relevance of universities in the 21st century. But a really important difference between the work that the Koki project is doing and perhaps some of the commercial data analytics offerings um, that we're sometimes compared to is that Koki is approaching data about scholarly communication from a critical research perspective. So we began bringing data together because we had some research questions. We wanted to know what data could tell us about what it means for a university to be an open knowledge institution. Um, and we are thinking really hard and critically, not just about what's in data sets, including the commercial data sets that are available to most librarians and most universities, but also about what's missing from those data sets. So for example, can we see publications from Africa and Latin America in the data? Do data sets include information about different research disciplines? Where are the humanities, for example? Um, is the data on books any good in the data sets that we often are using at universities to understand scholarly communication? Um, and if it's not any good, uh, you know, are decision makers aware of some of the challenges in that data? And are there any things that we could do to improve data about books and the visibility of books in data sets related to open knowledge? Um, we're also really interested in whether there are communities that want to be more visible in the data sets that are being used to shape research evaluation and policy. Um, and I think the stakes on that have become incredibly high as we move towards a data-driven world where data is being used to support decision-making at all levels in the policy-making and institution um, process. And being invisible in those data sets is really now, I think, much more significant than it might have been 20 years ago. So I think we need to think critically about whether or not um, some communities are being left out of data sets and are being made invisible if perhaps they might prefer to be more visible. Um, and perhaps most importantly for us, we're thinking about whether or not it's possible to build open, transparent, community-governed data resources that place universities and research communities in the driving seat when it comes to understanding what's in the data that's being used to evaluate them. Uh, and is it possible for us to begin helping communities to use publicly available data or data that they have contributed to and helped to curate uh, in order to tell their own stories about open scholarship. So the first thing that we did as a research team in 2018, when we um, kicked this project off, was to um, pull together a group of people with very different perspectives on scholarship and open scholarly communication and bibliometrics, and to um, write a manifesto uh, which is a collaboratively authored book that is finally going to be released 
as a reasonably priced paperback by MIT Press in September, which we're really excited about. Um, of course, it's also going to be available in open access, so keep an eye out for it. But the book sets out the framework that's driven our approach to capturing data that relates to scholarly communication. So it's shaped the approach that we've taken to thinking about what's in our data, as well as how we build systems that are open, transparent, and wherever possible, community engaged um, and governed when it comes to thinking about community data on open scholarship. So our team is working with genuinely big data relating to scholarly communication. Uh, we stopped counting the number of data points in our data set uh, a couple of years ago when we got to something like 12 trillion data points. And I was advised by our data science team that it, it doesn't really make a ton of sense when you're working with genuinely big data to talk about the number of data points. Um, but you know, really at this point, we are working with a very, very large data set and the type of data scientists that we have working with us on that are data scientists who have previously worked on radio astronomy data sets, for example. Um, and we're using cloud-based computing approaches to link together data that in first preference for us is open data um, and to explore the stories that data can tell us about open access and scholarly communication. So that you can, you can see here that this is just one slice through our data set. Um, and it includes information about publications relating to 18,000 institutions. Um, and we're capturing data from a whole range of sources. This is just um, a limited sort of set of the, the range of sources we're actually collecting data from. Uh, and perhaps most importantly for understanding our data set, it's worth thinking about the fact that we've linked it together in a way that allows us to explore it through different lenses. So for example, we can explore the profiles of institutions. We can look at the same data from the perspective of an individual country or of funders or publishers groups and collaborations. So as an example of what some of those different perspectives look like, we've got a dashboard that looks at open access um, according to country on the Koki website. Um, and I'll share links to that afterwards. But this dashboard just focuses in on the proportion of research that's open and um, you know what what the characteristics of the open access um, publications that we're able to see look like and it's one slice of our data so you can go and select countries and have a look at how those countries compare in the dashboard we've sliced the same data set in a different way uh, to tell a very different story uh, in our sources of acknowledged research funding dashboard that's also available on the Koki website. Um, and this data set, rather than looking at proportion of open access, is looking at who are the largest funders of um, research publications for individual countries and how do those different profiles of countries compare. But both dashboards are just different slices and different lenses what, on what's essentially the same linked data set. So in addition to data about DOI research publications, we're also working to capture data that relates to the diversity of our research communities. So diversity data tends to be harder to come by than data about publications because it isn't always collected. And it's also collected in different ways in different countries. So data about the number of women working in universities seems to be um, the one thing that we've been able to find uh, that relates to diversity that's collected in most countries around the world. And you can see here that universities in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and the UK are all slowly creeping towards gender parity when we look at measures um, of diversity 
that might tell us something about the communities that are making knowledge, how open are our communities rather than uh, how open access are our research outputs. Uh, but this area of um, data analysis related to the diversity of research communities is still really tricky. Um, and there's a huge amount of work that's yet to be done in relation to understanding race and ethnicity, ethnicity language, gender identity, and other measures of diversity that we might want to think about um, and perhaps begin to plot when we're thinking about, well, what does open mean uh, for universities? Are we just open in what we're publishing? Are we just throwing books over the wall? Or are we actually thinking about how we can open our doors to ensure that the groups who are being invited in to produce those publications are also um, at least slightly open and diverse. Um, so the question that I was given when I was invited to take part in this event was what have I learned about open access scholarship through data storytelling? And if I had to pick just one lesson, which is actually really hard, it is that it's a lot easier to get people to pay attention to conversations about open scholarship when those conversations are supported by visualisations. So for our team, visualisations have been the key to capturing the attention and imagination of senior leadership within our own university and also to prompting conversations about how international open access landscapes are changing and why open scholarship might be helpful in an Australian context. So the climate change open access dashboard project that we're working on at the moment is a really concrete example of how visualisations can support what I think is a very powerful story about open access. This dashboard is still in its infancy um, and it's just a first attempt to begin visualising the extent to which the research that might be needed to tackle climate change is open and available for communities to build on and to uh, take action on. Um, and, you know, I think, so this, this dashboard at the moment is just looking at research on the topic of climate change uh, rather than all of the research that might be needed to tackle climate change and defining what that research pool is, is actually a big challenge that we're going to have to work on over time. But I think that uh, the fact that only 42% of research on the topic of climate change is currently open access is something which is pretty concerning, but also something that points to an opportunity space that we might want to think about as an open access advocacy community. Data visualisations also have an important role to play in helping Australia to understand where we sit in relation to global open access trends. So you can see here that the direction of travel for open access in Australia is heading in the right direction. We're seeing um, you know, lines that point up, which is always a good thing. And since 2010, open access rates have increased from around 30% to about 45% for Australia. Um, Australia is doing a little better than New Zealand. So we can see that from the bar chart. Uh, and we're more or less on par with the US in terms of total open access rates. But our nearest neighbour, Indonesia, is performing uh, much more strongly than we are. Um, and the other thing that I think is important to note or really interesting to note in this data is that you can see the effects of green embargoes in the data. So where we see that sort of down tick uh, in the green line, in the line graph on the left, that's something that we're not seeing in the gold line on total rates of open access. And we're pretty confident that what we're seeing there is actually the effect of embargoes on a green open access in Australia. So I'm now going to hopefully just switch, yeah, to a graph animation of the same data. And I'll share the link to this. I think it's really interesting and fun to play with because 
it makes it possible to see how open access changes over time. Um, and it's one way of thinking about how you visualise, first of all, the effects of green um, and the embargoes on green. So if we stop the graph at 2018, um, we can see green is looking pretty strong for everywhere except Indonesia. Um, and if we play that through to 2020, we see green falling right back in this bar chart, which is what we were seeing in the line chart earlier. The other really interesting trend in this chart is uh, looking at the effects of policy. So what happened after the HEFKI mandate was introduced in the UK in 2015? So we can see that before 2015, um, we're all growing at roughly the same rate, really, in relation to open access. And when we get to 2015, the HEFKI mandate is introduced in relation to REF. And then we see over in 2016, 17 and 18, green open access in the UK really expanding and taking the UK ahead in relation to open access rates. So I've also got another visualisation of what's essentially the same data. Um, and in this, chart, rather than just looking at whole countries, we've broken countries into uh, individual institutions. So we're looking at individual institutions as each one of the bubbles um, in the chart, and we've colour coded those. So Australian research institutions are in black, uh, Euro uh, European research institutions are in green, and North American research institutions are in blue. So we can play this animation and we can see what happens between 2010 and 2020 in relation to green and gold open access rates. Um, and so just to be clear, gold is the axis on the left and green is the axis on the right. Uh, so once again, if you keep an eye on Europe, which is green, and we can have a look in this chart at what happens after 2015. So I've started the chart on 2015 and I'll play it through and you can see 2016, 2017, 2018, there's a big shift to the right for Europe as they um, implement the HEFKI open access mandate. And then we see the effects of the green embargoes as we go into the 2019 and 20 data and everything drops right back on the green axis towards the left-hand side of the chart. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting about this chart, which I could play with for hours because I think it looks like champagne bottles, uh, bubbles, and I love the fact that it's possible to hover and see individual institutions and to play and to see what happens at different points in time. Um, but I also think that this animation is a really powerful way to think about not just the effects of uh, policy changes um, or the effects of embargoes, but also to think about the effects of regional infrastructures. So uh, we can see Latin America, these brown countries, are really quite high up on the gold axis right through um, the time period that we're looking at in this chart. And um, we believe that the reason we're seeing such strong gold open access performance among Latin American countries is very closely related to investments in infrastructure that were made in Latin America and in particular CLO. Uh, the other interesting thing to note is that the top performers on open access in the world, uh, depending on whether you look sort of towards the green over here, we have the University of Gondar, which is in Africa, um, which, you know, perhaps we might not have expected given our focus generally on um, North America and Western Europe in a lot of these discussions. And we're also seeing incredibly strong performance again for Indonesia, um, but for Asia in general. So um, I think that this visualisation is a really good way to begin thinking about diversity.
um, in the open access landscape globally. So, so another aspect of the data that's relevant to conversations about whether open access policies make a difference uh, in different national contexts is the proportion of research outputs from individual research funders that are made open access. So in the first bar chart, you could see that we, we end up with a single number that says that Australia has about 45% open access for its research publications. But if we break that down by research funder or funder acknowledgement in uh, published research outputs that we're seeing, uh, we can see that actually there's a lot of diversity within uh, those numbers if we're looking at individual funders. So the ARC is responsible for a very high proportion of um, acknowledgements in published research outputs by authors in Australia, by Australian academics and researchers. But of publications that are acknowledging ARC funding, we're only seeing around 60% uh, open access rates. Uh, we see a pretty similar proportion when it comes to NHMRC um, funded publications. And we can compare that to what happens if a publication acknowledges funding from the US National Institutes of Health, which has a very strong open access mandate. And we're seeing about 95% of NIH publications with at least one Australian author uh, being made open access. The other interesting thing here um, is the, first of all, the proportion of Australian research outputs that are acknowledging uh, funding by a Chinese funding agency, the National Natural Science Foundation of China. Um, and this is consistent internationally. This isn't just Australia that's seeing a very high proportion of research outputs acknowledging funding from China. Um, but those publications tend to have very low rates of open access, again, um, reflecting the absence of a research funder mandate. So our data set contains many stories about open access and open scholarship. How do we choose which of those stories we should tell? Um, and I think um, for our team, this is beginning to be a real focus for us. We're acutely aware that the choices that we make when we visualise data can make an enormous difference to the information that's being emphasised and the narrative that the data presents. Um, and we're also um, acutely aware that different groups that sort of want to engage with our data set have got different needs and different interests when it comes to how they make use of that data and what they do with it in a practical sense at their own institution. So for us, at least part of the answer to this question has been working with communities to understand or to help them to understand what's in our data set and the stories that that data could be used to tell, and then creating tools that can help uh, librarians or other groups of um, people working with open scholarship, open access, making decisions about policy uh, to use the data to tell the story that they need to tell. So, I'm going to, in a minute, play a part of a dashboard walkthrough uh, for a project that demonstrates this approach to um, building dashboards with stakeholders and with communities that have got some practical purpose in mind for the data and for the dashboard. I'm not going to play the whole walkthrough because it goes on for a little bit of time, but I will share the link to that walkthrough in case you're interested. Okay. Um, so, all right, last slide. So, finally, from the perspective of our project, telling stories about open scholarship using data visualisation. 
um, is we think an incredibly powerful way to help stakeholders to understand where they sit in scholarly communication landscapes, um, as well as where they're headed and the opportunities that might exist for change in their specific local context. Um, but I think for our team, it's incredibly important to remember that visualisations are only as powerful as the data that sits behind them. Um, and more often than not, the commercial data sets that we've been exploring are not nearly as transparent or as inclusive as we might like them to be. Um, and from where I'm sitting, I think that um, it's really important to start thinking about how we um, come together as a community to develop data resources capable of supporting open scholarship and how we as a community can um, make sure that those data resources build on publicly available data and, and that they're transparent and that they can include an element of community governance and accountability. Um, so I think that's it from me and I'll try. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucy. That was um, incredibly interesting. And I, I think you've given everyone a lot to, to sort of mull over and think about. Um, I know that there's quite a, a lot of questions already on the Slido board. And please don't forget, if you have any questions that you would like to have answered during the Q&A, pop the questions on the Slido board. OK, um, I think now uh, we can move on to our second speaker, uh, Martin Borshert, University Librarian at the University of New South Wales. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's good to be here. I'll just uh, share my screen as well. <clears throat> How's that looking? Good. So I too would uh, like to start with an acknowledgement, please. Um, I want to give an acknowledgement of the Bedical and Gadigal peoples, um, who are the owners of the land where University of New South Wales is located and where we work and I live. Also, I would like to pay my respects to elders. So today, uh, I wanted to talk about a few things. Um, one, just to give an overview of open access Australasia. Um, also give an account of some things happening um, here in Australia and around the world in the open scholarship space. Um, so then I just wanted to talk also about some ideas of ways you know, to help implement open scholarship in your, in your own workplace. And then finally talk about some things at the end uh, that uh, we're working on with Open Access Australasia um, to help with progress. So let's go to the next slide. So just, this is the only slide about Open Access Australasia. Uh, it was the AOASG until recently, but uh, we've done a rebranding and a renaming um, with our, after working with our, um, after working uh, with our members. Um, so we are a membership organization with 28 uh, member universities across Australia and in New Zealand as well as well um, as some other members um, as well. And we're really trying to progress the open scholarship space, um, really with focusing on publications, preprints, also on peer review um, um, around books and monographs and theses. And um, we support a broad range of initiatives, uh, working with other groups around the world um, and here in Australia. Um, I've been the chair for quite a, a few years, and my thanks also go like kind of to Ginny Barber, um, who is the who is the director and who's also helped me with a lot of these slides as well. Next slide, thanks. So everybody, I'm sure, is aware that last year, with everything happening with the pandemic, was really working like an inflection point for openness. There was a greater need for openness and a greater level of engagement with openness as well. And um, we've seen an acceleration 
in the last year or two, um, I think in changes to openness um, in comparison to the previous years where there was always a lot happening, but it was running at a slower rate. So um, I think the pandemic's been an accelerator, but it's certainly not the only thing. Next slide. So just looking um, at what open access is, it's a range of things and it's a reminder of things, you know, that us working in libraries and other organisations with researchers can help to support. So um, um, it's around working with immediate free access, working with authors around retention of copyright for their works and also uh, reuse rights, attribution rights, and also that the works are permanently available. Next slide, and a Creative Commons license. Um, also, just looking at this one, you know, this is sort of old information, perhaps you don't talk that much about the different types of open access in this way, but here in Australia, after government funding quite a long time ago, we've all got our repositories. So you could see in the data slides from Lucy where Australia was placed. Um, you know, and so green open access has been quite, I think, a strong strategy here in Australia. Um, with the move to transformative agreements, we may see an increase in the gold open access publishing, and that may help to also bounce to one of the questions that was there. Um, I think you know, we'll start to see that, and it's important for us to be looking at the offers available and see if they suit our university. Um, in Australia, I don't think a diamond has had the same impact that we've had in other content, um, which we've had in other continents, you know, such as South America with Redelic. Um, this is where there's no cost to read or to publish, um, and then hybrid. And most of our universities have a perspective that we don't really support the hybrid model as much as some of the others because of the double dividend costings. Next slide. So there's, if we just give a brief account of, of what's been happening um, globally, um, it's been quite some time now that Plan S um, has launched. Um, it's active though, you know, this year. Um, it's really focusing on open access to articles, but also looks at journals, also looks at all the other infrastructure like repositories, um, which is to be made immediately open access. Um, also, like the also uh, the UNESCO um, has also had open science recommendations. Um, you may have seen that there was quite a lot of social media um, and other attention to that initiative recently this year. It's really looking at more than open access, and it, it really encourages to look at all the diversity of approaches uh, to open access. Um, APEX also had a policy statement on open science. Nationally, I'm sure many people in the audience will have seen that the NHMRC has had a consultation process around immediate open access to articles as well. Um, and many of you might have seen some of the presentations also by, also by like the, you know, the chief of scientist, uh, well, we heard her from Cathy Foley, uh, who was talking about the priorities for her work in office. And one of those was to work in the open scholarship space. Um, and Call's also done a release on the end goal of open access and is going to be doing, um, I think, a lot more work on the publish and read agreements, working with the publishers, which a lot of our libraries are buying material from. Next slide, thanks. So just a reminder about Plan S, um, you know, it's, it's really stating that from the start of this year, are that, are that all the publications that result from research funded by all the grants uh, will be made available um, either in open access journals or platforms. Um, so, you know, that's really having a big effect, um, especially in some parts of the world. And we've seen that in some of the graphs that we saw earlier. It also includes rights. It also includes a rights retention strategy, uh, which um, works also with repositories. There's also a support there for open book publishing um, and new models. So I think we always have to be open to new models. 
Next slide. Let's just go back to the UNESCO draft of open science recommendation. Um, so the recommendation is to provide for an international framework for open science policy and practice, um, which still is going to like to recognize our disciplinary and regional differences in open science perspectives. Um, it, um, it also gives a definition um, it talks about like the shared values, principles and standards for open science. Next slide. Um, here's a slide just giving an overview of the objectives um, and areas of action for the UNESCO recommendations. So that there's a common understanding um, of open science and the benefits and challenges, as well as to the fact that there's a diversity, I think, of pathways. Um, it's important to also to have like another policy environment, um, which is an enabler. It's important for us to invest um, in open infrastructure and services so that we have the diversity and the choices there. It's important to invest in our people so that there's, a, so that there's an understanding um, of the options and how to best use them. There's also the cultural aspects to align with open science. Um, we need to make sure that people know and understand of the innovative approaches that are available. And last of all, we have to work together with a broad range of stakeholders to have the maximum impact in the way that we can change things and provide um, options for people using all different kinds of models and infrastructure. Next slide. Um, the NHMRC, which had a consultation this year, uh, was a revision to their policy on open access. Um, the major change there was uh, that publications arising from NHMRC funding uh, must be made openly accessible immediately upon publication without an embargo period. And then the second part was that authors will retain necessary rights to enable them to publish and share their publications in any form at any time. So uh, we'll, I'm sure that we'll be hearing back from that um, after they have a process looking at all the feedback. Next slide. So what NHMRC is doing um, with this proposal is going to align NHMRC uh, with Plan S, although they're not members at the moment, um, also helps to align with also also with other funders. Um, but we haven't heard uh, from all the funders yet in Australia if there's going to be a change later. Next slide. You may have uh, seen this presentation where. The we're like the chief scientist, Dr. Kathy Foley, uh, spoke at the National Press Club, um, spoke about uh, the use of information um, and that the lack of access to information is a roadblock. Um, so I think that was very, very helpful and important uh, for setting the stage in Australia for work to be done in the future, perhaps on a national approach. Uh, to open scholarship and it's very interesting to hear also also I think um, at that time um, early um, in her time as chief scientist uh, that open scholarship is one of the focus areas so excellent next slide so what does this all mean for yeah, for our researchers and for people working in libraries and other areas working with researchers I think we can certainly say that open access is here to stray. Um, it's also growing. And it's not just for publications, but it's for all points around the research life cycle, including methods, data, um, and integrity. We're starting to see funders' resolve to open access is, is now growing and strengthening. And um, leadership within our institutions is really important. And certainly uh, people who work in libraries and other research 
areas working with our authors have a lead role to play. Next slide. Um, so just a few slides just on some ideas to think about what might work at your own institution, um, to work with your authors, help guide them, um, also work with university leaders, help to develop uh, the pathway forward. It's important to try to make the transition as easy as possible for all your researchers. That means um, that you've got people who they can talk to, that they understand all of the discipline differences and those nuances as well. It's about, you know, we have to provide information to university leaders and committees um, and, you know, and like the research office and authors as well, and take the, all the opportunities you can to have discussions um, at your university with the broadest range of people. I think that like uh, to support diverse models is really important at this stage. Um, it's my opinion that to support only one model, you wouldn't get as far as if you support multiple models, even though that that means that there's the complexity to deal with. Certainly, I think as, as we go through the transition period, I think um, you know, the complexity may increase, um, but I think to support a wide variety of models probably will make more progress in a shorter time, I think. Um, it's important to incorporate fair principles um, in what we do as well and explain the impact of that and, and how that's going to work. Um, and also, there are people in our libraries who you know, have the opportunity to work closely with publishers um, you know, and to work hard in negotiations and try to get the best deals that we can, but also working with call who leads on a lot of those programs. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so libraries can provide expertise in all the areas around having an open access policy um, and all of the other related policies. Um, you know, we can bring a lot of skills to negotiations as well, and um, just a lot of support generally. Next slide. I think in your university, um, in your organization, say, for example, if you're working in the library or the research office, I think it's good to think about who has what role um, and which groups of clients they're able to work with um, because you may have invitations or opportunities to speak or to provide a range of informational papers. So um, at my institution here, I've I found it um, helpful and you know that I could get items on the agenda, talking in academic board, uh, talking in research committee, uh, talking in learning and teaching committee, also have invitations to faculty boards and school meetings. Um, I think it's important to you know meet with people wherever they are working and go to their environment and to have the discussion and present them with information and have a Q and A. Um, you can't assume that you know, people have access to all the different spaces. So you really have to go to all of them and work out who's going to go to those and have a strategy. Um, many of you will have an OA week. Um, we've tended to sort of move to a month here at UNSW because that's the way that we can, you know, a work to go to our various meetings that we wanna cover. Um, to have a greater amount of airplay with more people present. Next slide, thing. And then just going back to the types of, of, of OA and a multi-pronged approach, I, I personally think it's still a good time to support all of these models, you know, so keep your repository working, uh, continue to promote it, uh, to update the version of the software if you can, make sure the integration is working well with research management system and try to make it as easy as, as you can for people. Um, I, I also think it's a good time to work with our publish and read agreements. Um, and I think they have had a lot of airplay around the world. And I think a lot of authors may even be 
hoping to see them at your institution soon. I do think it's important to negotiate them very strongly um, and choose the right ones that fit for you at, at this time. You know, the, you know, there's certainly no need to make them all available at once if you can't afford them all, you know, so use the time as a negotiation point. Um, investing in open infrastructure, such as working with SCOS, which I work with um, as well, is also important um, just to make sure that we have the infrastructure options available. Um, and to support your researchers working in other innovative approaches like the defense. Next slide. So I think, you know, it requires university leaders to develop a university-wide approach, um, I think, and, um, you know, we can learn from each other's approaches, but I think it has to be a customized approach for what works with the opportunities at your institution at that time with the people who are there at that time. Next slide. Uh, I do have one other slide that was in my new version that I'll just speak to. I think it's important to strategize to ways that work with your institution. So, you know, what's going to encourage people to put their material in the repository at your institution? Um, you know, can you provide reporting to each faculty or school? Is there a way for you to have a competition around deposit or perhaps a competition around usage of the repository to encourage the culture of deposit um, and to make it interesting and exciting for people and to want to know about it? Um, I think it's important for library staff to be um, the experts. Um, um, around understanding all the publisher offerings. Um, you know, that's an obvious thing to say, but, um, you know, you often have to have that information right at hand because when you're talking to the researcher, you need to have it then and there. Um, also, uh, like I said, to assess the agreements, um, it's important, I think, to be able to report on open access publishing at your institution. So, um, Use whatever data sources you've got, whether that's related to research assessment or you're doing some other things as well. Um, try to know what the APC costs um, are for your institution, what they're likely to be. And maybe talk to researchers about whether they're actually paying them or whether they're getting discounts or waivers as well. Um, I think it's good to talk. I think it's good to work with researchers so to gather stories um, of where open access has brought them together, you know, with other stakeholders or partners in the country or around the world, and just to understand the difference uh, that open access has made to work. And part of that would be also to identify champions in open access um, in your institution and, and ask them to tell their stories to others and ask them to help you in the communications that you're doing to um, your faculty. And another thing which is very obvious is to map your support mechanisms around the research life cycle so that it's understandable from the view of the researcher. Um, next, I'm just going on to um, talk about working here at Open Access Australasia um, to help build capacity. So, um, you know, we have a lot of member engagement. Um, we have events, we bring people together as well. Um, we have a community of practice. Uh, we do a range of webinars and, and we've also got our social media. So please look out for that. Next slide. Um, so we've been working uh, with CALL um, on helping to provide advice to funders, um, also to the chief of scientists and to the office of chief scientist as well, um, thinking about maybe what would the elements be in a national approach to, uh, to, to open scholarship. Um, we've had input to the international um, events that I was talking about before. Um, and it's good to do that because often if you're working with them, you know, you get to have the discussions, you get to nuance. Um, you can often help in the formation of things 
Um, so it's good to work closely with them. Keep going. Next slide. So last of all, um, I invite you to have a look at the new website for Open Access Australasia uh, and to reach out and make contact. Um, and as always, we're very happy to help you um, or I'm very happy to also answer your questions later on in this session. Thanks very much. So um, Martin and Lucy, um, Michelle here from RMIT University. So I was just going to be going through some of the questions um, that will probably be direct. Some of them might be for one of you or both of you. So um, we might just start getting onto those. It's just past four o'clock and we've got a, a fair bit of time, but um, I might just get started with that. But thanks again for both your presentations. They were terrific. Um, first question uh, is about the project at Curtin. So Lucy, you might want to take this one. Um, why is the project at Curtin called Open Knowledge rather than say Open Scholarship? Uh, because we wanted to think much more broadly than publications. So we were thinking about knowledge making. So epistemology and processes of how knowledge gets made and also the communities whose knowledge is seen as legitimate or certified or valuable or useful. So we, we actually began with quite a, um, a serious theoretically driven discussion about the scope of our project and with a particular interest in models of knowledge making that think about um, you know, the, the role that margins play. So communities that might not always be at the centre, um, but in points of tension where disciplines overlap and actually really important knowledge gets made because occasionally there's competition or there's tension or there's something that's not always a super peaceful process, but we get some fantastic knowledge that's made at those points of contact. And also about the role that marginalised or, or less visible communities play um, in producing the knowledge that is ultimately um, being certified by universities and coming out of universities. So we're about a much bigger project than just open access, um, which is why I mentioned that data about diversity and the work that um, we've been doing, thinking about who's represented in our data sets, what can we see, what is it that we're missing. If we were able to design better uh, systems for capital capturing the really um, exciting things that happen inside universities and the knowledge that universities help to facilitate um, what other things might we want to try and capture in that process. Thanks, Lucy, for that. And um, I think there's a couple of other questions that sort of speak to that as well. Um, so the next question, I don't, don't know whether Martin would like to answer this, um, but who is the best equipped in libraries to promote or instruct on open access? Uh, does it fall to the liaison librarians or should there be a more specialised role? So there are, you know, there are different views about that. Um, in my library organisation, we have a manager of scholarly communications. Um, many of you may already know Emma, um, but I, I, I think it's useful to have a role which is like a service manager for I think a major initiative. I mean, I agree that um, um, it is the business, but we have service manager roles for other business as well. So I, th I think it's good to have a specialist role um, you know, for I think like for all of our businesses, really. Um, but I think in the delivery, I think you want your organisation to have a strategy about who is going to deliver what, because I don't think that the delivery it sits only with the outreach librarians, you know, like only with the liaison librarians, um, only with the manager scholarly communications. I think you've got to have, I think, a total strategy. So, um, you know, each of the stakeholders in your organisation understand what their role is and who their target audience is. You know, like, for example, I, I know that in my institution, you know, I go to academic boards, so I'll talk about those things. 
um, you know, like that I'll go to research committees, so I'll talk about things, but I don't go to all the school meetings. So people who go to school meetings have to also be prepared to be able to do um, all that work as well. And people who liaise, you know, like go with the research office, they need to be prepared so that they know what their role is too. Thanks, Martin, for that. Lucy, I don't know if you had any comments about that. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I think I think Martin's covered it pretty well. Um, cool. And I don't pretend to be an expert. <laughs> There's a the next question that's coming up is about um, what's about storytelling. So, what stories about open scholarship? we're currently unable to tell because the data doesn't exist. Um, what would be needed to get the data to tell those stories? Right, so we're thinking uh, really actively about that at the moment. Um, I think, so the simplest example of, of where data becomes really frustrating really quickly uh, relates to books. And you would think, well, you know, open, I mean, scholarly books in general, it's not even just open access books, but if we really want to stand, understand what's happening with books and how often they're being used and where they are in the data sets that relate to uh, scholarly communication at the moment, we've actually, when we dig in, got very, very poor visibility on books. And um, some of those are legacy issues, they're to do with the fact that the book industry um, has been slow to move to digital formats. They've got their own data standards, but also um, that lack of visibility for scholarly books is um, directly connected to the fact that our two major uh, commercial providers of, um, of bibliometric information, so Scopus Web of Science um, and Clarivate data um, has really been created to support the needs of science communities. So I think um, books are a, a really concrete example and something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of as being very poorly represented in data sets related to scholarly communication, but also then also for open access scholarly communication and humanities in general. Um, and also, um, so non-traditional research outputs, we've got a project kicking off uh, next week, looking at best practice fair open access for non-traditional research outputs. And I think that's very important, figuring out what do we advise our communities on? What do we do when people come and say, we want advice, we are producing non-traditional research outputs, how do we handle them? Where do we deposit them? What does fair open access look like for our outputs? And the other area that I would love to see more um, data on relates to the grey literature, particularly in the Australian context where we're thinking about impact and engagement and how research that's being made in universities has an impact on policy. What, where does that happen? Where is that nexus? And I think the grey literature is a really obvious point where we should be taking a look to see, well, you know, how is this literature being used? Where's it coming from? Where's it going? What's going on with it? And we can't see that. So, um, so they're all things that I, I kind of think, well, in wealthy developed countries, I was genuinely surprised by how messy those parts of the landscape were. And that's before we even get to thinking about publications from Latin America and Africa, which in the data sets that we've really dug into, are, you know, it's, it's quite terrifying the extent to which publications from different regions in the world are simply left out of our commercial bibliometric databases. So, um, yeah, I think we're just going to have to, as a community, I think the first step to what we do to tell more diverse stories is I think that uh, we need to become more aware of what's not in commercial data sets. We need to start asking questions of our data set providers um, and our citation <laughs> information suppliers. We've got to say, hey, where is this other stuff? Because at the moment it's not there. And we've got to, you know, start thinking about what we can do ourselves. How do we build the data sets and link them up? 
Yeah, and I think the next question, Martin, would you like to comment? Yeah, I on did. That? I just wanted to make a comment there. You know, I think all the stories around data are super important and, you know, we are working to develop those. It's great, you know, to see what's happening with Koki and the data set. But there's also the people stories as a data source. You know, the people stories are just as important as I think are the data stories. So, you know, it can be really powerful to find out who some of the champions are in your university and go and interview them and find out what the people story is associated uh, with open scholarship and use that story um, to help with communicating uh, to, to other authors in your institution. Because, you know, because we all like to hear those stories and I think that they're just as important as the data. Yeah. I have to agree with Martin. I think that those stories are even more important than the data at the moment. And for me, I think part of part of this, you know, how do we use data to sell open scholarship? Well, part of the answer is um, I would love people to be more critical about the data that they're using. And when data isn't going to tell the whole story, I think it is incredibly important that we think, okay, well, how do we tell our stories in different ways? And humans are a really great way to do that. Thanks for both of you for those comments. Um, this, the next question sort of leads a little bit on from that idea of um, uh, comment and reflect on dealing with Indigenous community data, um, who owns it and the complexities of making that data open. I don't know if either of you wanted to take that one. Well, I mean, it's a huge question, um, and we are we are, have Katie Wilson on our team, who is really most focused on our team on looking at um, how we might collaborate with Indigenous partners um, and help amplify the stories that those partners want to tell with their data. So I think it's really important. Um, for our project that we're thinking about how we amplify diverse voices in data sets so that we don't all get swamped by data from high energy physics about their world um, and the type of knowledge that they're making. So I think that um, where we are able to work with partners to help them to amplify their own voices, I think that's a, a useful approach that we've been thinking about. But in general, I also think we've been hearing really excellent things. We've been very impressed by the Indigenous Data Network in Australia. Um, and there is now starting to be some really fabulous work that's going on in that space. Mm. Um, it's also, um, it's the topic also of a symposium that's on tomorrow and next week through call. So if you're interested in that, um, I, would encourage people uh, to register for those events, um, which will be really interesting to see, and I will certainly be attending. Yes, and we moved today's session for those so to make way for people to go, so that's great. Um, the next question is: um, Have you found that having the Open Knowledge Initiative at Curtin, I guess, has had an impact on OA publishing at Curtin? Has it influenced the culture there, um, or I guess, what, what do you think? does influence the culture around um, away? Uh, I think that's a really tough question. Um, I think, so from, from where we sit, we began this project thinking about how we could provide senior decision makers in our own university with um, better information that could support them in making good decisions about um, open scholarship at Curtin. Um, and we have been incredibly fortunate in the level of support that we've had for our project. So I think the, the fact that the university at a very high level has been willing to support and encourage and engage with the work that we're doing, for me is an incredibly encouraging sign. So I think we are seeing really good things happening in relation to open access at Curtin. Um, and I feel like I have seen a change in the six years that I've been at this institution, uh, that there's more awareness of open access, there's a lot of discussion about how it can be supported, but whether or not 
um, that might also, for example, have something to do with the work that AOISG has been doing, the work that's been happening in call, um, and some of the other really fantastic international advocacy efforts um, that are going on around open access and open scholarship. I think that those probably have pay, played a more important role um, in the shift towards open access at Curtin than just our project. Um, but yes, but we're also really interested because we're now able to collaborate, for example, with the library um, and we can talk to the library about what our data can show and, and how they might be able to use it to support the work that they're doing. Um, and we're having similar conversation with deans of research and we have a lot of conversations with our research office about our data set and what it might tell them and how they might understand what's happening at Curtin more effectively. Uh, thanks for that. Um, the next question is a bit of a provocation. Due to budget restrictions, is it realistic to expect an uptake in gold standard um, open access publishing? I might go first. Uh, so that's a great question. You know, um, unfortunately, you know, this movement um, into transformative agreements is happening at the same time as we've had uh, the budget impact from the pandemic. And some of our institutional libraries have maintained budget, but many have not and have lost actually quite a lot of their buying power. Um, you know, I've always been quite open, but my institution library, we can't afford all the read agreements that we used to have. So, you know, we certainly can't afford moving them all to read and publish or to publish and read, assuming that publishers might want more money for that. So, you know, I think what we need to do is we need to pick and choose and negotiate very strongly for what works for our institution at this time. And because, you know, it's taking a publisher by publisher approach, I think it's fine to uh, work with publishers uh, for, you know, like for early agreements um, and maybe delay others. And of course, this helps, you know, also with negotiation. You know, I just think waiting and time can be one of your best friends in negotiation. So, you know, you can, in a way, use it to your advantage. And I do think that the publishers that we choose to support the publish and read agreements with early will have an early to market advantage because I think we will see authors in the disciplines move to unite you know, like to publish more with those publishers because they know that they won't um, have to pay an article processing charge. So thanks, yes. Um, I might just skip one question quickly because it's related. So with the rise of the publish and read agreements, this is around terminology. Um, someone's asked where are they captured in the data? Are they included in the gold? Yes, they'd be in gold. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, the question I think this is for Lucy. What software do you use to visualize the data? Uh, well, so we started, uh, we've used various different um, approaches over time. Um, at the moment, we're using Kibana and Elastic. Um, so we've decided that we should. Uh, eat our own dog food and embrace open source um, technologies. And so we're using Kibana and Elasticsearch. Uh, and we've got a GitHub. If anyone's interested in seeing our code or seeing what we're doing and, and playing with it, we're happy to share. But at the moment, it's um, Kibana. Thanks for that, Lucy. Um, does Koki also collect and visualise long-term data on the benefits of OA, um, for example, like increased citations, et cetera? Yes, so we do. Uh, and, yeah, and, and we see very consistent citation advantages for open access um, when we do look at that data. So that's one of the very consistent uh, stories that comes through in our data set so much so that we're now it's like it's a little boring but we do absolutely have the citation advantage data that's being captured 
Cool. I think the next question is for Martin. So are there any plans on expanding membership of Open Access Australasia, for example, to TAFE institutions? We've always been open to membership and, and we occasionally reach out uh, to non-members and provide them information about benefits um, and membership. But ultimately it's, you know, it's really up to potential members to want to sign up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're muted, Michelle. Sorry. Is an opportunity to partner with developing countries to provide green OA? It's troubling. There is a disparity there and gold OA is a significant expense. Sorry, was that? Did you hear that question? Yeah, I'm just I'm just reading it because it because it was yeah. done there. Yeah. Um, so um, it, there's been an interesting development with Redelic, which is uh, the diamond or green open access system uh, for South America um, and some of the Spanish speaking nations. Um, I believe that they've extended an agreement uh, to African nations to uh, provide and support it as well. And they've had a lot of success with that infrastructure. Um, and it's a single joined up infrastructure. Um, it's a model that, that we haven't had um, in Australia. So as we've gone um, for the model where each institution has their repository rather than to have a national infrastructure. We did pose that question um, a few years ago uh, with the call review of repository infrastructure. Um, we felt that at the time, at the time, we felt that, you know, the instrument, the infrastructure you have, which we all have, um, you could achieve uh, greater gains in open access just by maintaining it. And so the focus would be really on people um, working on training and culture and usage rather than reinvesting in new infrastructure for Australia. We thought at the time that that was the best approach in that report. Okay, thanks for that, Martin. I think we've nearly reached the end of our, um, our quick Q and A time. We've sort of got like one minute to go. Um, there was a comment that it would be handy to have some case studies of open access and nitros, non-traditional research outputs. Um, but we might have to leave it there. I think we might have just run out of time. So thank you to you both. Um, and I'm now going to hand back to Susie uh, to close the session. Thanks, Michelle. Um, that does bring us to the end of today's forum. Thank you so much to Lucy and Martin for sharing your insights, your expertise, and of course, your time. Um, thank you also to everyone who's asked questions and everyone who attended today. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Crick Committee for organising this event. And if anyone has questions for the speakers, um, you can send an email to members at caval.edu.au and Sarah will provide you with the contact details. Uh, I'd also like to mention that Crig and Caval have arranged for native trees to be planted through the organisation 15 Trees as a thank you to the speakers. Uh, and finally, a reminder that the next Craig, uh, Craig, sorry, a webinar in the SOS series is held this Friday, the 25th of June, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. And a link to the website with the speaker and registration details can be found in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming and goodbye.